Hello, and welcome to Quarantine Storytime. I'm Elise Bauman, and today I will be reading from J. Sheridan Le Fanu's notable novel, Carmela? Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know, I've never heard of it. Chapter one, an early fright. In Styria, we, though by no means magnificent people, inhabit a castle or schloss. Small income in that part of the world goes a great way. Eight or nine hundred a year does wonders. Scantily enough, ours would have answered among wealthy people at home. My father is English and I bear an English name, although I never saw England. But here, in this lonely and primitive place where everything is so marvelously cheap, I really don't see how ever so much more money would at all materially add to our comforts or even luxuries. My father was in the Austrian service and retired upon a pension in his patrimony and purchased this feudal residence in the small estate on which it stands, a bargain. Nothing can be more picturesque or solitary. It stands on a slight eminence in a forest. The road, very old and narrow, passes in front of its drawbridge, never raised in my time, and its moat, stocked with perch, and sailed over by many swans and floating on its surface white fleets of water lilies. Over all this, the Schloss shows its many-windowed front, its towers, and its Gothic chapel, the forest opens in an irregular and very picturesque glade before its gate. And at the right, a steep Gothic bridge carries the road over a stream that winds in deep shadow through the wood. I have said that this is a very lonely place. Judge whether I say truth. Looking from the hall towards the road, the forest in which our castle stands exceeds 15 miles to the right and 12 to the left. The nearest inhabited village is about seven of your English miles to the left. The nearest inhabited schloss of any historic associations is that of old General Spielstorf, 20 miles away to the right. I have said the nearest inhabited village because there is only three miles westward, that is to say in the direction of Ge General Spielsdorf's, Sp Spielsdorf's schloss. Wow. General Spielsdorf's schloss. I'm having flashbacks to film in Carmilla. This is wild for my mouth. A ruined village with its quaint little church, now roofless, in the aisle of which are the moldering tombs of the proud family of Karnstein, now extinct, who once owned the equally desolate chateau, which in the thick of the forest overlooks the silent ruins of the town. Respecting the cause of the desertion of this striking and melancholy spot, there is a legend which I shall relate to you another time. I must tell you now how very small is the party who constitute the inhabitants of our castle. I don't include servants or those dependents who occupy rooms in the buildings attached to the schloss. Listen and wonder. My father, who is the kindest man on earth, but growing old, and I, at the date of my story, only 19. <laughs> Eight years have passed since then. I and my father constituted the family at the Schloss. My mother, a Styrian lady, died in my infancy, but I had a good-natured governess who had been with me from, I might almost say, my infancy. I could not remember the time when her fat, benignant face was not a familiar picture in my memory. This was Madame Peredon, a native of Bern, whose care and good nature now in part supplied to me the loss of my mother, whom I do not even remember so early I lost her. She made a third at our little dinner party. There was a fourth. Mademoiselle de La Fontaine, a lady such as you term, I believe, a finishing governess. She spoke French and German, Madame Peredon French and broken English, to which my father and I added English, which partly to prevent its becoming a lost language among us and partly from patriotic motives, we spoke every day. The consequence was a babel, at which strangers used to laugh and which I shall make no attempt to reproduce in this narrative. And there were two or three young lady friends besides, pretty nearly of my own age, who were occasional visitors for longer or shorter terms, and these visits I sometimes returned. There were our regular social resources, but of course, there were chance visits from neighbors, only five or six leagues distance. My life was notwithstanding, rather a solitary one, I can assure you. My governance had just so much control over me as you might conjecture such sage persons would have in the case of a rather spoiled girl, whose only parent allowed her pretty nearly her own way in everything. <laughs> The first occurrence in my existence, which produced a terrible impression upon my mind, which in fact never has been effaced, was one of the very earliest incidents of my life, which I can recollect. Some people will think it so trifling that it should not be recorded here. You will see, however, by and by why I mention it. The nursery, as it was called, 
though I had it all to myself, was a large room in the upper story of the castle with a steep oak roof. Can't have been more than six years old when one night I awoke and looking round the room from my bed failed to see the nursery maid. Neither was my nurse there and I thought myself alone. I was not frightened for I was one of those happy children who are studiously kept in ignorance of ghost stories, of fairy tales, and all such lore as makes us cover up our heads when the door cracks suddenly, or the flicker of an expiring candle makes the shadow of a bedpost dance upon the wall, nearer to our faces. I was vexed and insulted at my finding, and I conceived, neglected, and I began to whimper, preparatory to a hearty bout of roaring, when to my surprise, I saw a solemn but very pretty face looking at me from the side of the bed. It was that of a young lady who was kneeling, her hands under her coverlet. I looked at her with a kind of pleased wonder and ceased whimpering. She caressed me with her hands and lay down beside me on the bed and drew me towards her, smiling. I felt immediately delightfully soothed and fell asleep again. I was wakened by a sensation as if two needles ran into my breast very deep at the same moment and I cried loudly. The lady started back with her eyes fixed on me and then slipped down upon the floor and as I thought, hid herself under my bed. I was now for the first time frightened and I yelled with all my might and main. Nurse, nursery maid, housekeeper all came running in and hearing my story, they made light of it, soothing me all they could meanwhile. But child as I was, I could perceive that their faces were pale with an unwanted look of anxiety, and I saw them look under the bed and about the room and peep under tables and pluck open cupboards, and the housekeeper whispered to the nurse, lay your hand along the hollow in the bed. Someone did lie there. So sure as you did not, the place is still warm. I remember the nursery maid petting me and the three examining my chest where I told them I felt the puncture and the pronouncing that there was no sign visible that any such thing had happened to me. The housekeeper and the two other servants who were in charge of the nursery remained sitting up all night. And from that time, a servant always sat up in the nursery until I was about 14. Girl, you coddled. I was very nervous for a long time after this. A doctor was called in. He was pallid and elderly. How well I remember his long, saturine face, slightly pitted with smallpox, and his chestnut wig. <laughs> For a good while, every second day, he came and gave me medicine, which of course I hated. The morning after I saw this apparition, I was in a state of terror and could not bear to be left alone. Daylight though it was for a moment. I remember my father coming up and standing at the bedside and talking cheerfully and asking the nurse a number of questions and laughing very heartily at one of the answers and patting me on the shoulder and kissing me and telling me not to be frightened. that It was nothing but a dream and could not hurt me, but I was not comforted for I knew the visit of the strange woman was not a dream and I was awfully frightened. I was a little consoled by the nursery maids assuring me that it was she who had come in and looked at me and laid down beside me in bed and that I must have been half dreaming not to know her face. But this, though supported by the nurse, did not quite satisfy me. I remembered in the course of, the, of that day, a venerable old man in a black cassock coming into the room with a nurse and housekeeper and talking a little to them and very kindly to me his face was very sweet and gentle, and he told me that they were going to pray, and joined my hands together, and desired me to say softly while they were praying, Lord, hear all my good prayers for us, for Jesus' sakes. I think these were the very words, for I often repeated them to myself, and my nurse used for years to make me say them in my prayers. I remembered so well the thoughtful, sweet face of that white-haired old man in his black cassock as he stood in that rude, lofty brown room with the clumsy furniture of a fashion 300 years about him, and the scanty light entering its shadowy atmosphere through the small latisse. He kneeled and the three women with him, and he prayed aloud with an earnest qua quavering voice for what appeared to me a long time. I forget all my life preceding that event, and for some time after it all obscure also, but the scenes I have just described stand out vivid as the isolated pictures of the phantasmagoria surrounded by darkness. What a last sentence is that? Vivid as the isolated pictures of the phantasmagoria surrounded by darkness. Thank you for listening.